on this edition of Expose. Foreign detainees abused by guards, assaulted by dogs, even dying in custody. No, not Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo Bay, but prisons right here in the United States. One reporter got to the bottom of it with help from the inside. Funding for Expose has been provided by From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. Over the next two days, we're going to explore a world of what the government calls administrative detention. And it has almost nothing to do with the war on terrorism. NPR's Daniel Zwerdling has our report. In the fall of 2004, National Public Radio broadcast a report exposing grim conditions faced by many immigrants, illegal and legal, held by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The reporter was Daniel Zwerdling, a 25-year veteran of NPR. The people who I know who've become journalists, basically at the time that they were three years old, they were already questioning authority. They were already saying, now wait a minute, why do I have to take a nap every day at 1 p.m. in kindergarten? Back in the 1990s, Congress passed a series of laws that set in effect, from now on, if you're a non-citizen, and it turns out that you've ever committed a crime, the government can detain you and then deport you, even if the offense was something like taking the subway without a ticket. This is the file from last year of all the different people that called me from the immigration detention facilities. Zwerdling learned about the story from a New York immigration attorney, Brian Lonigan. He told me the Department of Homeland Security rounds up hundreds of thousands of immigrants every year. The government puts these immigrants in jails and prisons all across the country. They hold them there for months or years, and many of these immigrants are kept in horrendous conditions. Swerdling's first report focused on this New Jersey prison and its use of attack dogs to control inmates. The dog was on drugs, <laughs> like that, from the back of his throat. Like, he's actually dying to bite you. Wow, wow. Wow, like, get at me. And Lewis says then one of the officers called out. Let him bite him, let him bite him, like that. Then that's when he clamped into my arm. At the very same time that people all across the United States were horrified, seeing the pictures of what was happening at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, those dogs lunging at people's bodies, it turned out that the exact same thing was happening at a jail in New Jersey. Guards were using attack dogs routinely, day in and day out, deliberately to terrorize the immigrant detainees who were in that jail. The very next day after the story that I did, the Department of Homeland Security told all the jails and prisons it uses, more than 400 jails and prisons, you cannot use dogs anymore around detainees, period. But there was more. Zwerdling had learned immigrants could be held without being accused of a crime and without access to a lawyer. Then there were troubling accounts of inadequate health care, misdiagnosed medical conditions, emergencies ignored, even unexplained deaths. So I started getting anecdotes from jails around the country, anecdotes where somebody collapsed, according to the immigrants, and it took forever for anybody to help them. And I started, you know, trying to see, could I get eyewitnesses? Could I get documents? And I started to sort of hit pay dirt I guess you could say, most quickly with Richard Rust's case at Oakdale Federal Prison. A 34-year-old Jamaican native, Rust had died in May 2004 while in custody at a federal prison in central Louisiana. Zwerdling learned of the death and the questions being raised about it from a New York-based advocacy group called Families for Freedom. We took a trip down to Oakdale, Louisiana. When we go down there, the entire place is on lockdown. What's going on? Oh, Richard had died a couple weeks before, and they don't want any word to get out. 
But word had gotten out in a letter signed by dozens of Oakdale's inmates. They write, a terrible incident has taken place. A fellow inmate passed away, suffering from cardiac arrest. Richard's death was unfortunate and unforeseen. However, we are disputing the absence of procedure on the unprofessional behavior of some officers on duty. And then this really got to me. We may be immigrants, but we are humans first. And then more than 30 detainees whose uh, whole lives, really, whose whole futures hang in the balance, they were willing to sign their names and um, risk retaliation. All they wanted in this case at Oakdale was that, you know, they wanted somebody neutral to investigate what happened to this poor young guy. Detainees who knew him say Richard Rust was a popular man in their prison. Homeland Security locked him up last year with almost a thousand other immigrants in the middle of Louisiana. They call it Oakdale Federal Detention Center. It's surrounded by fences with electric sensors. There are thick forests on three sides. The men say Rust was a gentle detainee and a loyal friend. So they were shocked when they saw what happened to him just after he turned 34 years old. Zwerdling believed he had a story and suspected the incident at Oakdale was an indication of widespread problems. But it would take more than a two-page letter to document the events surrounding the death of Richard Rust. He needed to speak directly to the men who were there when Rust died. So then I called Oakdale itself and I talked to the public information officer there and said I'd like um, to come visit the prison, I'd like to see the facilities, I'd like a tour. A spokesman for Oakdale responded to Zwerdling's request with a voicemail message. Uh, based on your request, did speak with the warden. But with regards to an interview at the, uh, at the institution and a tour, that, that has been denied by the warden. But he added, if you put your questions in writing, we'll answer them in writing. So I sent them a list of more than 50 detailed questions. Who investigated the circumstances surrounding the death of Richard Rust? How did they conduct their investigation? How many detainees and staff did they interview? Did the investigators review security camera images? They answered three of them. It would be very nice if I could have gotten a document that said, uh, yes, you know, we, the investigators at the Oakdale Federal Prison, confirmed that Richard Rust collapsed and that it took forever for anybody to help him medically. Uh, I doubt if that document exists, and if it does exist, uh, I wasn't getting it. So the only way to start understanding, you know, is this story real or are people making this up, is if I get, you know, one person, then a second person, then a third person, then a fourth person who all witnessed it to tell me basically the same thing. With no access to the prison, there could be no inmates to interview. And Zwerdling knew without the inmates, there would be no story. Hi, do you have a minute? Always. I'm a great believer in giving people the latitude and the support to pursue their dreams. I would say that I've never met a reporter uh, whose every dream gelled into stories. But I think if one out of three um, becomes a story, that's, uh, that'll get you into the Hall of Fame, 333 batting average. My biggest break came when Families for Freedom told me, we know somebody who's still at Oakdale Federal Prison. Maybe he can help you. His name is Patrick Brown. A Jamaica native, Patrick Brown was admitted to the U.S. as a permanent legal alien in 1995. A petty theft conviction would lead to more than two years in federal detention, during which time he says he was beaten and permanently injured by guards. You can't call people at these prisons. You have to write them letters. So I wrote him a letter. I told him what I was doing. I said, you know, could you please call me, collect someday? And one day I got a call from Patrick Brown, and I said, would you help me? Would you help expose the truth of what happened that day? Brown had not been at Oakdale when Richard Rust died, but Zwerdling sensed he had an ally, someone whose unique access would be critical to the story. And I said, will you be my deputy? Can I deputize you to start trying to find somebody who witnessed what happened to Richard Rust? He said, let me see what I can do. 
I told him I'm very easy going with people. I, I get along with people real good and I'll, I will ask around and I will definitely get back in touch with him. A lot of detainees, at first they said yes, they would cooperate. But when it came down to the nitty gritty, a lot of them said no, they ain't gonna do it. My main mission was to convince them, look, this is us. If that happened to this man, which is us, me, you could be next. So what are you gonna do, man? We gotta stand up, we gotta, we gotta let people what, know what these, these people here are doing to us. I didn't hear from Patrick Brown for a few weeks, and I thought, well, that's probably the end of him. And one day, I get this call. This call is from a federal prison. And it was Patrick. He said, I have somebody here right next to me who says he saw what happened to Richard Rust that day. So he put the guy on, and I, you can only talk with people at this prison in 15-minute increments, right? And then the phone cuts off. So we were just getting into the story, and the phone cut off. But they called back the next day. And then a few days later, Patrick called, and he said, I found a second person who says he was here that day. And over the next few months, he kept calling and calling and calling with people who witnessed what happened to Richard Rust from various perspectives. So you saw him on the floor? Yeah, he was on the floor. The guy's just, like, trying to give him air, you know, so he could breathe. Because he said he wasn't breathing, and, and, like, he wasn't really moving. You know what I'm saying? These guys had everything to lose by talking with me. They were waiting for the federal government to decide their case and decide, can they stay in the United States? Or are they going to be deported back to countries they haven't seen since they were children, in some cases? He could have talked to one person, but what he wanted was to see if the stories are consistent with each other, if, if, if everything is matched up here. I'm always skeptical, to a certain extent, of what everybody tells me. The government official, the immigrant who claims he's been beaten, the environmentalist who says the lake is terribly polluted. He didn't believe anything I said until I proved it to him. If I said that something happened, then I had better be able to prove that either with documents or a witness. And then, you know, wouldn't you know, he'd go back and check with that witness to make sure. He started, you know, not only wanting to see the letters that we sent to Oakdale or to Homeland Security, but wanting the fax cover sheets and the confirmations to prove that it actually got there, which I thought was great due diligence, but it was annoying for us because it was like, come on, man, we sent it, you know? That's how we got a response. I'm not calling them because I think you might be a liar. I'm calling them because, you know, you can't do a story without getting other people to verify information you gave me because we just always have to do that. I deal with a lot of journalists. Invariably, they call me up. They say, I'm doing a story on XYZ. What do you think? I give them three or four sentences of, uh, you know, this, a soundbite um, or a nice pithy quote to put in a story. And then they hang up and they call up the government and they get a counterpoint. And so you have this point, counterpoint, Brian Lonigan says this, the government says that, there's your story. That doesn't do anybody a service because we're all bombarded with different points of view that all have equal weight. Well, every point of view does not have equal weight. Lies should not get the same amount of weight as the truth. Here's what all these detainees told me. Richard Rust was born in Jamaica. He moved to Brooklyn legally to live with his father and stepmother. Then back in the early 1990s, he committed a terrible crime. Richard Rust had a troubled past, no question about it. When he was a young man in his early 20s, he was convicted of statutory rape. He had been having sex with a relative beginning when she was 11 years old. So there's absolutely nothing you could say to excuse that. To me, what distinguishes him from other major journalists from major venues was that he wasn't letting the label of Richard's crime or the fact of Richard being a criminal alien stop him from seeing that we're talking about a human being that died in administrative custody. And he went to prison for three months. And when he came out of prison, he lived the next 10 years, by all accounts, as a model citizen. He went on to do electric work. He was making money. He was supporting his two children. He was just a regular guy living in Brooklyn, probably a good person from what I gather from all the people that loved him in his life. But under federal immigration laws, none of that matters. The laws say if you're not a citizen and you've ever committed one of a wide range of crimes, 
that the government must eventually detain and deport you, even if you committed the crime years ago and served your sentence. He was fighting his case. His family had actually got an attorney in Brooklyn. They were trying to get him a hearing down there. People were ready to testify for him. But before he could actually fight for his rights, his life was cut short. It's May 29th. It's late in the day, and it's the weekend, so the guards let detainees spill out of their cells and go to the recreation area. Some start watching a prison soccer match. Others play dominoes. They say Richard Rust shoots some baskets. In the late spring Louisiana heat, Rust collapsed with an apparent heart attack. Word spread quickly through the rec area. Everybody was in the rec yard, and then we heard, uh, what say, it was, they said somebody having a heart attack in the uh, rec yard. Homeland Security's detention centers and federal prisons issue detailed medical standards that their employees are supposed to follow. The standards declare that staff should respond to medical emergencies, quote, within a four-minute response time. In an email to Zwerdling, a prison official insisted that medical personnel responded immediately to the crisis. But the witnesses Zwerdling interviewed told a different story. Prince Brown and other detainees say they don't see anybody an Oakdale staff rushed to help Richard Rust within four minutes. I was looking at my watch. I was saying, if somebody have a heart attack, where's the, where's the medical at? You understand what I'm saying? And it took medical almost 40 minutes. Brown says worried immigrants are already crowding outside the rec center by the time the head officer on duty shows up. That's Officer Taylor. That 40 minute span, that could have saved his life. Once Taylor arrives, he doesn't apply life-saving measures, as medical standards say he should. Taylor lowers his ear to Richard Rust's mouth. Rust wasn't breathing. The officer feels his wrist. There's no pulse. He really got into recreating the scene. Sort of, I felt like I was in a courtroom, and he was doing the trial that should have happened. I say to people, tell me where you were, tell me what it was like that day. What was the weather? Where were you sitting? What were you doing? How many steps did you take? Um, what did the walls look like? Um, what are you doing with your hands now? Show me how they held you. The medics wheel rust away on a gurney. The hospital's records show that doctors call a code blue when the ambulance brings him in. They use shock paddles to try to revive him. But Richard Rust is declared dead at 7.29 p.m., May 29th, 2004. We couldn't prove in our story um, whether Richard Rust would have lived if they had gotten help to him. You know, some people have heart attacks and there's nothing anybody can do. But I called half a dozen top people all around the United States who have run medical departments and jails and major prisons, and I gave them the basic facts, and all of them said, if what the detainees tell you is true, this is disgraceful. It might even be criminal. Have you seen any documents that say that's actually what they're supposed to do? Like, are there written guidelines? The way that Danny works, he does all of the reporting from the people who are bringing him the story, in a sense. And then he begins the process of trying to get to the people who represent the other side. Please notice that the date stamped on this letter to me is June 13th, 2006, okay? Dear Mr. Zwerdling, this letter is in reference to your Freedom of Information Act request dated June 9th, 2004. Please excuse our tardiness in responding to your request. And then they tell me that I should write to another office. You would think that they would want to say, come on in, we want to talk to you, there's absolutely another side. Your request is being referred to another office. And in some cases, it's, it's really um, their lack of response that feeds the story takes them a year and a half to tell me that we're not going to send you most of the documents that you asked for. We are making very serious charges about individuals and about the system. And I don't know how you can do that responsibly and not bend over, 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 over backwards to make sure that we've given them every chance possible to respond and prove to us that we're wrong. We can't get anybody in the federal government to talk about this case. A spokesman for the Department of Homeland Security told me they couldn't talk about it unless I got a notarized letter of permission from Rust's family. The spokesman said they want to protect Rust's medical privacy. So I got notarized permission and sent it to them. And they still wouldn't talk about Richard Rust. And this time, a spokesman gave a different reason. He wrote an email saying, we realize you got the notarized letter, 
but Homeland Security can't talk about the Rust case because Oakdale is managed by the Bureau of Prisons. Call them. We journalists do tend to say, you know, phone calls went unanswered or NPR was unable to... I, you know, I got to the point in a story a couple years ago when I thought, forget it. The public needs to know that their public servants, who they are paying, are doing everything possible to deceive us and to avoid telling us the truth. The detainees say every immigrant who spoke out about Richard Rust got marched off to the hole, the box. Detainees say they lock you in a tiny cell without windows. They say the wardens sent more than 50 detainees to the hole for weeks. Patrick Brown called me a number of times and told me that he had been put in the hole several times. I was targeted, I was put in the box for no given reason, like three occasions. Um, the captain, he told me I was a black piece of because he'd been hearing that I've been trying to um, get other inmates to testify against um, the staff of Oakdale for killing an inmate there. You making the jail look bad. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You stopping them from making their daily bread. Come on. I'm hurting so much. I feel so much pain. Ain't nothing scary about me telling people what happened to me. You took a big risk. I helped him when I was out. So I know I ain't with no repercussion. You understand what I'm saying? He helped him while he was in there. So that was a brave, brave thing he did. Patrick Brown was deported to Jamaica in July 2006. A month later, we interviewed him there. He continues to fight to return to the U.S. Well, it's very hard being deported, especially when you are deported with nothing. For being in jail now than to be out here because it's it's even harder. You know, I've been I've been without food a couple of days, and I ain't got food. I ain't got really. I'm just staying with someone that's that's you know just just showing a kindness out of their heart. NPR aired Daniels Wordling's 22-minute report, The Death of Richard Rust, on December 5th, 2005. Detainees say they'll never forget the day Rust died. I heard through Mr. Zerlin that the story would be on, so I informed the detainees to listen. And it was very, very, it was a good feeling. It was a good feeling. He showed that other people care. You understand what I'm saying? It's like uh, sometimes when you locked up there behind that wall, man, you just feel alone. You just feel isolated. You just feel like, yo, ain't nobody give a F about me. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We've spent months investigating how Richard Russ died, and there's still a lingering question. Is the story of Richard Russ a fluke, or does it reflect a bigger problem that affects detainees across the country? Swerdling brought up other detainee deaths in his report. He suspects a systemic problem. But proving deaths like Richard Rust's are widespread requires extensive digging and time. It had taken him over a year to document just one death in federal custody. We have a lot of airtime to fill at NPR. And in some ways, it would be much better for the network if I churned stories out every day that could, you know, fill up time on Morning Edition or on All Things Considered, whatever. We visit congressional offices. We go to Senate offices. Um, and we tell them things. But it's really hard sometimes to get people to actively listen. And having Danny's piece in NPR was a really great way to get people to actively listen. And some influential people did more than just listen. Shortly after Zwerdling's story aired, members of the House Judiciary Committee directed the Government Accountability Office to investigate health care in facilities holding immigrant detainees. Officials at GAO have told me that is directly because they heard NPR's story. A good investigative journalist is never cynical. The minute you are cynical, it's time to hang it up and do something else. Good reporting is about hope. It's about the fact that we hope that if we educate enough people about what's going on with this particular issue, that people will start to change things and make them better. Daniel Zwerdling, NPR News. Patrick Brown remains in Jamaica, still barred from entering the United States. He has sued the Correctional Center where he claims to have received abuse and serious injuries. He is seeking an attorney 
to take his case on a pro bono basis. On July 6, 2007, the nonpartisan GAO issued a report on general conditions at such facilities. Its findings detail a broad range of violations, including unsanitary kitchens and overcrowding. The study also found that detainees were routinely unable to contact their consulates and legal advisors due to systemic telephone problems. An in-depth report on medical conditions is forthcoming. Expose has been provided by